from this subject the all important question whom say ye that I am the all important question bless us Lord that we do no damage to your word but preach that which is sound doctrine and gospel May we both apprehend and comprehend your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. But whom say ye that I am? This is the most important question that can be asked. Jesus asked this question of his disciples. John G. Butler had this to say concerning our text. He says, here our Lord gets personal. He wants to know what the disciples think. Our spiritual well-being matters not what others believe, but what we ourselves believe. Our spiritual well-being, your spiritual well-being, does, is not predicated, it's not built on what others believe. It's built on what you believe. Amen. Henry said this. He said, this is a question we should, every one of us, be frequently putting to ourselves. Who do we say? What kind of one do we say that the Lord Jesus is? I like Henry's take. He said we should ask ourselves frequently, who is Jesus to us or to me? What place uh, does he occupy in our hearts? Do I still believe like I once believed? Henry goes on to say, it is well or ill with us according as our thoughts are right or wrong concerning Jesus Christ. Everything is based on what we think or what we believe when it comes to Jesus. People have asked the question, what is Jesus going to do with this person? Or what is Jesus going to do with that person? That's the wrong question. The right question is, what are we going to do with Jesus? Because he is Lord. There is no way around that. We will all have to face him someday. All of us. And it will be well with us or ill with us depending on where we stand with Jesus or how we answer this question. And not simply how we answered it five years ago. But what our answer is today. Eternity hangs in the balance. This is one, this is the one question that we must answer correctly and that we must keep the correct answer. You can't at one point believe that Jesus is the Christ. 
And then later on in life, after a few trials and tribulations, say, well, I think he is. Oh, I'm not quite sure now if you're going to be saved. You have to, uh, Jasmine, answer it right. And you have to maintain that place. I'm preaching already. Um, as it was then, so it is now. The correct answer was not one that was made easy to give, nor to maintain. I want you to think about what I'm saying to you. It was obvious for only those who could see through the Father's eyes who Jesus was. For those who could see through the Father's eyes, it was a no-brainer. But it wasn't obvious for everyone else. And our text will show that Jesus, and I, need, I really need you to hear me. I really need you to hear me. Jesus himself took great measures to not allow the answer to be obvious. I, di I didn't say that Satan tried to make the answer difficult. You heard me right. Jesus took steps to make sure the answer to the question that he was going to ask them was not an easy one to give. And what you're going to learn is that salvation, saints, takes effort. See, Christianity is not a lazy man's religion. Some of you don't do good in Christianity because all you do is sit, on, sit there. Christianity requires thought. Christianity requires effort. To know God requires seeking God. I'll tell you the extent of your knowledge of the God of the Bible. I know how to determine how much you know about the God of the Bible and I will be right about it every time. How? To the degree that you study the Bible. If you don't read the Bible, you don't know the God of the Bible. See. To the degree. Your knowledge of scripture. Is your knowledge. Of the God. Of the Bible. Some of y'all are getting quiet. Because, because some of you are sitting there saying. Well, if, if By that measure. I don't know very much. Touche. Read your Bible. Get to know him. Because. He's the one who says, seek me and you will find me when you have searched for me with all of your heart. It takes effort to know who God is. Praise the Lord. It takes effort to grow in grace. Amen. It takes effort. See, See, to get the Lord to come in sometimes and break some of these chains. Some of us have chains in our lives. We have um, swords in our homes. And you want everybody else to pray for you, but you're not praying. You go to every member of the church, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. But in, in the course of a day, you don't pray one minute. The Lord has said, I'm waiting on you. You're saying to the Lord, God, I'm waiting on you to move. God said, I'm waiting on you to seek me. I'm waiting on you to put forth an effort because there's a whole lot that I want to show you. There's a whole lot that I want to give you, but I'm not going to let it just fall in your lap. 
It takes work to be a good churchman. It takes work to be a good preacher. It takes work to be a strong, involved elder. I salute these men of God sitting up here who gets to church early and stay late. Who make the sacrifice. It takes effort. I told someone the other day I would not cheapen the eldership of our church by having hard working elders and then add to the list lazy people. It cheapens the whole thing. This thing is a highway. And you got to come up to it. Jesus said, I have a question for you. But uh, I'm not going to ask the question in a place where the answer is obvious. I'm going to take you with me. We have about uh, 25 miles to go. We got, we got to travel north to what is known today as the Golan Heights. Uh, we're going to leave Galilee, Jewish territory, and we're going to Gentile territory. Some of us think that it's the devil fighting against us. It ain't the devil in many cases. Satan's not omnipresent. Sometimes the devil's over in China trying to get somebody. And you think he's the one. Where, the only person who's omnipresent is God. Right. Satan cannot be everywhere at one time. Right. He's limited. limited. Hmm. But see, the Lord wants to know how much am I, how much am I worth to you? To what degree are you going to put forth effort to know me? Some of, our, some of us, our marriages aren't working because you're not putting anything in it. Not good, doing, on, doing good on the job because you're the last to show up, the first to leave. Your health is not well because you're not investing in it. See, the God of the Bible operates this way. He said, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent taketh it by force. If you're going to be saved, you got to want to be saved. If you're going to get the greater revelations from the Lord, you got to really want them. Our text says that Jesus went and when says when Jesus came, slide number one, to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. Now they were in this area here. This is Galilee. Our Lord's headquarters were Capernaum. Was Capernaum. The tribe of Dan is up this way. And here is Caesarea Philippi. This is the dead, the Galilean, Sea of Galilee. Down for the south, not pictured, is the Dead Sea. So here's the Jordan River. The Jordan goes through Lake Hule. And look at those arteries of the Jordan. And the Jordan breaks off and is right here near Caesarea Philippi. You see that? Everybody see that? Yes, Amen. So you, you see there's Caesarea. There's the Jordan, Lake Hule. There's the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, Galilee, all this was our Lord's headquarters in Capernaum. So he leaves this largely Jewish area. I, I love this kind of stuff. And he goes up to Caesarea Philippi. Let him see the second slide. You can just see it just a little clearer. There it is. And you also see right here, this is Mount Hermon, where the Lord will do the transfigurations on the mount. But he hadn't done that yet. So they, they're up here in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea is about 25 miles north of Galilee. And um, Caesarea is not, slide three, it's not the Caesarea on the Mediterranean. So there's two Caesareas 
uh, in the scripture. There's Caesarea on the Mediterranean, and then there's Caesarea Philippi way up, not on this map. So there's two, I don't want you to get them confused. They're about 93 miles apart from each other. Caesarea Philippi was approximately 25 miles from Galilee. Caesarea is about 62 miles southwest of Galilee. Now the question is, why did Jesus go to Caesarea Philippi? Barclay gives us uh, some wonderful treatment with regards to what took place during that time. Are you with me today? Barclay said this, he said, the population of Caesarea Philippi was mainly non-Jewish. And there Jesus would have peace to teach the twelve. So he took them on somewhat of a retreat. Amen. A lot of corporations that go on retreats and all that stuff take their employees out. They learn that stuff from Jesus. See, he did it first. So he takes them alone up to Caesarea. And while up there, our Lord had a problem Confronting him. Confronting Jesus at this time was one claimant and demanding problem. That is one urgent problem. And uh, Mother Turner, the problem was his time was short. At this point, uh, Mother Withrow, in Jesus' ministry, he has only six months to go before Calvary. Before they would put him to death. So he has an urgent and demanding problem. His days in the flesh was numbered and he knew it. The problem was, was there anyone who understood him? Was there anyone who could recognize him for who and what he was? Was there any who, when he was gone from the flesh, would carry on his work and labor in the kingdom. Time's running out. It's been three and a half years. I selected these 12. And I see the end coming. Is there anyone in this group who know? who I am. Obviously, that was a crucial problem for it involved the very survival of the Christian faith. Had they not got this right, we wouldn't be here. Wouldn't be here today. So this was crucial. And claiming. And uh, if that were were none who had grasped the truth or even glimpsed it, then all his work was undone. If that was the some few who realized the truth, then his work was safe. So Jesus was determined to put to the test and to ask his followers who they believed him to be. It is one of the most dramatic interests to see where Jesus chose to ask this question. Hear me well. There can have been few districts with more religious associations than Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. Jesus didn't take them to a place where the only house of worship was a synagogue. He didn't take them to a place where uh, the background would favor him. 
He took them to a place littered with multiple religions. See, some of this stuff that's happening in the world today that we think the devil is bringing in, God is intentionally muddying the water. Because he wants to know where do you stand? See, everybody's on the Lord's side when they're not tempted. Everybody's on the Lord's side when it don't cost them anything. But the Lord want to know who's on my side. That's why I love Chloe so much. When it counts. When it counts. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. The area was scattered with temples of the ancient Syrian Baal worship. Thompson in the land and the book enumerates, is what Thompson said, he said there was no fewer than 14 such temples in the near neighborhood. Here was an area where the breath of ancient religions was in the very atmosphere. Here was a place beneath the shadow of the ancient gods. Not only the Syrian gods had their worship there uh, at uh, Caesarea Philippi, Philippi. Hard by Caesarea Philippi, there arose a great hill in which was a deep cavern. And the cavern was said to be the birthplace of the great god Pan. Would you show them slide number five? I want them to see this God, Pan, uh, who was said to have been the patron God. Look at him. Looks just like the devil. And his, his, he had a great, great temple there. And there was a deep cavern there. And Pan was said to be the God of nature. And by the way, from this cavern, from this stream, uh, it was said to believe that this was the place from which the Jordan River got its start. So uh, this was there. Thank you so much. So much was Caesarea Philippi identified with that God that its original name was Paneas. So Jesus goes to a land whose original name was that after the false god, Pan. And, and to this day, the place is known as Bunius. The legends of the gods of Greece gather around Caesarea Philippi. Pray with me, if you please. Further, the cave was said to be the place where the source of the Jordan River sprang to life. The Jewish historian Josephus said this, this is a very fine cave in a mountain under which there is a great cavity in the earth. And the cavern is abrupt and prodigiously deep and filled with still water. Over it hangs a vast mountain and under the cavern arise the spring of the Jordan River. The very idea that this was the place where the Jordan River took its rise would make it redolent. It would make it reminiscent of all the memories of Jewish history. The ancient faith of Judaism would be in the air for anyone who was a devout and pious Jew. Bear with me. But there was something more. In Caesarea Philippi, there was a great temple of white marble built to the Godhead Caesar. It had been built by Herod the Great. 
Josephus, the historian, said, Herod adorned the place, which was already very remarkable. Still further, by the erection of his temple, which he had dedicated to Caesar. In another place, Josephus described the cave and the temple. When he said, and when Caesar had further bestowed on Herod another country, he built there also a temple of white marble. Hard by the fountains of the Jordan. The place was called Panaeum where there is the top of a mountain which is raised to the immense to an immense height and at its side beneath and or at its bottom a dark cave opens itself within which there is a hor horrific or horrible precipice that descends abruptly to a vast depth. It contains a mighty quantity of water which is unmovable. He goes on to say, and when anyone lets down any measure to the depth of the earth beneath the water, no length of cord is sufficient to reach it. Later, it was Philip Herod's son, who further beautified and enriched the temple, and he changed the name of Panaeus to Caesar, or Caesarea, that is Caesar's town. And then he added his own name, Philippi, which means of Philip, Caesar's town of Philip. To distinguish it from Caesarea, on the coast of the Mediterranean. Still, still later, Herod Agrippa, he changed the name to Norinesis to honor the Emperor Nero. No one could look at Caesarea Philippi, even from a distance, without seeing the pile of glistening marble. This is the place where Jesus chose. And, and thinking of the might and of the, of the divinity of Rome. When you would see Caesarea Philippi, it didn't make you think about the God of the Bible. It made you think about the power, the might, and the divinity of Rome. Here indeed is a dramatic picture here is a homeless penniless Galilean carpenter with 12 very ordinary men around him at, at, at the moment where the orthodoxy are actually plotting and planning to kill him the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the elders were putting together plans to kill Jesus because they thought that he was a dangerous heretic. He stands in an area, an area littered with the temples of the Syrian gods in a place where the ancient Greek gods looked down. Jesus stands in a place where uh, the history of Israel crowded in upon the minds of men, where the white marble splendor of the home of Caesar worship dominated the landscape and compelled the eye. And there, of all places, this amazing carpenter stands and asks men who they believe him to be. Good God Almighty. And not only did he ask them, but he expects the right answer. He asks them, uh, who do you believe I, I am? And, and, and he expects them to say, 
the son of God. It is as if Jesus deliberately set himself against the background of the world's religion. In all of their history and in all of their splendor and then demanded to be compared with them and to have the verdict given in his favor. Yes, Jesus, they walked 25 miles. He said, I, I need the right background to ask this question. If I ask this question and the only background they see is something from Moses, the answer might be obvious. If I ask this question and the only background they see is something that reflects Christ, the answer might be obvious. He said, no, I need to go where I know the background will not reflect me. Well, I know the, uh, the world's religions, the false gods of the world will be represented. And I'm going to set this thing up and I'm going to have them to stand in a place. And I'll stand where at my back, over my shoulders, there is all of these other religions in their glory. And I'm just going to stand here and ask, who do you believe that I am? And, and since he knew that their vision was 2020, that their peripheral view was real good, he knew while looking at him, they would see all of these other gods. Yes, that's what he did. He chose Caesarea. Philippi because he wanted to choose a hard place see because he wanted the answer to be given only by those who really knew him so here he is now he's standing there and again let me mention to you he expects the right verdict so I'm going to tell you something that you won't like today I don't believe that Jesus is giving any of us a break. I don't believe that Jesus understands when we choose false religions and choose false gods because the internet exists. I don't go along with this stuff, you know, everybody talking about, you know, Folk are facing stuff now that they, they never faced before. It's harder now. It's easier to get confused. It's harder now. I argue that it's not harder. Right. When was the last time you heard of a, pre, of a Christian being fed to lions? When was the last time you heard of a Christian being beheaded for their faith in Christ? That's the way it was then. Caesar killed, Nero killed Christians for not denouncing Jesus. And here we are today, and especially black folk, right. we're getting all confused. Right. We're getting all off. Like this garbage I just read by this sick homosexual garbage. talking about he's sick of the God of the Bible. And, uh, and, and some of us are making excuses for people as they get confused. I actually believe that Jesus is allowing the waters to be muddied. I believe that he's allowing this because he predicted that as there were false prophets among the people, there will be false teachers among you who will privately bring in damnable heresies. The Bible predicted all of these movements that we are seeing in the world and Jesus is still up a room looking at us and asking us uh, who do you say that I am and he still expects us to come up with the right answer 
even though he allows all of this. When, when you went to college, uh, 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 young lady, uh, Chloe, you did exactly what God expected of you. I, I just wonder how many others did. Or did you get there and get intimidated by the size of the campus? Did you get caught up with all the girls and the partying? All the boys. What did you, what'd you do? What did you do on your job? How are you faring? Who is Jesus? Look at how Jesus made it difficult. I'm preaching good. Mm-hmm, I feel the anointing. Matter of fact, I'm preaching very good. Because I'm revealing to you that a lot of this stuff, the Lord is allowing. He's allowing. He didn't cause it, but he's allowing. The the Lord didn't build 14 temples to the Syrian god Baal. The Lord didn't build those glistening temples to the god Pan. The Lord didn't build those temples to the Roman gods, but he allowed them to be built. And then Jesus stood in front of every one of them and said, now who do you say? that I am. Can I get a witness? You see, a whole lot was riding on that question. And as the world religions glowed in their splendor, Jesus knew that he had something that was greater than that because, see, uh, uh, depending upon how they answered the question, Jesus had something to show them. See, because if you think that uh, the the hillside was glistening with marble of the false gods, Jesus had a plan in the next day or so to go up on Mount Hermon. And he's going to show you glistening because he's going to get up there and transfigure and then show all of his glory which would defeat the glory of all those false gods put together. That's in chapter 17. But but first, before I can show you my glory, he said, you got to give the right answer. Some of us, God has something for us, but, but, but before we get there, the answer has got to be right. It's got to be the correct one. The question is, who is Jesus? to you and in our text the Bible said that Jesus gave them a warm up question threw a softball at him he said after he got to the coast of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples "Uh, whom do men say that I the son of man am and uh, he said I just want to know what is the scuttlebutt what is the talk what are they saying online? He didn't say, what do Jewish men think? He said, I want to know, what do people think? And I heard them answer, and they gave some pretty good names. For they associated with Jesus. They associated Jesus with three great voices of salvation history. But they said, you are John the Baptist. Who was John? He was the great herald of a new age. For it was John who came preaching, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I heard him say, Some say that you are Elijah. Who was Elijah? Elijah was the prophet of power and miracles. He defeated the prophets of Baal. He prayed that it wouldn't rain for three years and six months. And then he prayed again and the heavens gave rain. Oh Lord, and I had them say that some say that you are Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the prophet of reform and hope. Uh, It was Jeremiah who said, break up the phallogram and sow not among thorns. And then I heard him say, I know the thoughts that I think toward you thoughts of good and not of evil and to bring you to an expected end. So Jeremiah had reform and Jeremiah had hope. Elijah had power and miracles. 
and John the Baptist was the herald of a new age. All of these were good answers, but none of these answered, none of these answers spoke to the uniqueness of Christ. You see, when you're dealing with Jesus, when Jesus looks to his right, he sees no one. When he looks to his left, he sees no one, for he's in a category by himself. He is the only savior of the world. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And I heard him say, no man can come to the Father but by me. When he came into the world, Jesus was the only one that the Father said, let all the angels of God worship him. When Jesus was baptized, the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when Jesus transfigured, the Father spoke again and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. There's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like Jesus. John the Baptist was special, but he was just a man, and he got discouraged along the way. Elijah was special, but he was just a man, and he almost gave up. Jeremiah was special, but he got so discouraged that he said, I won't preach anymore in his name, but his word is like fire shut up in my bones. There is nobody like Jesus. And after Jesus heard what they had to say about the people, Jesus looked at them and he asked them the all important question. He said, but whom say ye that I am? Rocky, we're going home now. Ah, Jesus, uh, Jesus is saying to us, especially, I want to speak to my black audience, Jesus is saying to my people, to sanctified black folk, I want to know, who am I in your eyes? He says, I've, I've, I've stood back and I've allowed the black Hebrews to come into the neighborhood and they are challenging my name. They are saying that the J was made up. I allow them, just like I allow them to build that altar to the God Pan. I allowed the Hebrews. I allowed critical race theory. I've allowed all of these things to come into society. I've allowed BLM. I've allowed the New Age spiritual movement. People claiming to be spiritual, but not going to church. I've allowed a proliferation of false teachers and false prophets. I've allowed COVID. I've allowed all this stuff. And yet in the midst of it, I got one question that I want to ask you. Who do you say that I am? Am I still the king of kings and the lily of the valley? Am I still in your eyes, the bright and morning star? Am I still in your eyes, the soon coming king? The Lord wants to know, do we still love him like we used to love him? Do you still clap your hands? Do you still have a praise? Are you still convinced with everything that's going on in the world, with all the lies that are being told on Jesus, with all the failures that you see in the church? Are you able to look at Jesus and still say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Say it! Say yes! If you're able, give him praise right now. Hallelujah! We're not going
gonna touch anybody, but just look at two or three people and ask them, do you still believe? Do you still believe like you used to believe? Do you still believe that he's a way maker? Do you still believe that he's a healer? Oh! Do you still believe that he's a way maker? Oh! Do you still believe that he's a company keeper in a lonely hour? Wow! Oh! Do you still believe that he's got more power than COVID? 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, so forth and so on. Do you still believe? If you believe, wave both hands and say, I still believe. I still believe. I still believe that he is my joy. I still believe oh, that he's my God. Praise him if you believe it. Praise him if you will. Hey, I'm through preaching, but I need about 10 people to say I haven't changed my mind. I haven't changed my position one iota. I still believe that he's the only savior. I say to the black Hebrews, take a hike. I say to the black Muslims, go somewhere. I say to the clan, you're dead in the water. I say to the racist, he made everybody. I say to the world that he's the answer. I say to everybody that Jesus Christ, he is who he claimed to be. He's my healer. He's healed my body so many times. He's my way maker. He's made a way for me so many times. Good God Almighty, he's my healer. He's a lifter at my head when my knees got weak. The Lord strengthened me when my back got tired. The Lord made me strong. Who is Jesus to you? Who is he? Is he still the Christ? The Son of the Living God. If He is, let me hear you. Praise the Lord. If He is, somebody praise Him in the room. Somebody praise Him in the room. preaching but I'm not going to lie I'm not going to lie I'm not going to lie I'm glad I'm glad y'all won't like this now but I'm glad that these other distractions are out here I'm glad the Hebrews BLM critical race LBGTQ writing all this God in a way, I'm glad that it's out there because it separates the real from the false. It separates the also lands from those who truly got it. When you've been born again, oh, when you've been born again, there is nothing Nobody can tell you. There's no book. There's no teaching that can change your mind. Because I know that something got a hold of me. I'm with 
to a meeting when I had my heart. It just wasn't right, but something. It was the Lord, he picked me up, he turned me around, he changed my mind, yes he did, and you never, ever talk me out of him, running, 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 I can't tarry, running up the king's highway, say yeah, say yeah. Question at you. And one is more important than the other. But both are important. Question number one is uh, upper room, who is Jesus? Upper room, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to us? Hallelujah. That's an important question. But there's only one question that is more important than that. And it's simply this. Not who is Jesus to all of us, but who is Jesus to me? Who is Jesus to you as an individual? Can you stand there just like Chloe did and say I've been born again? Can you stand up all by yourself and tell the world I tried him and I know him and I found him to be a friend? Can you tell the world I know for myself if the rest of you all don't even serve him, I still know that he's the savior of the whole wide world. If you know for yourself, you ought to praise him like you have the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God. Woo! Praise him like you know it. church at Ephesus you love me but you don't love me like you used to love me I want to know who loves him like you used to love him mm -hmm. I heard a song say I'm, I'm going to return to the God of my childhood I wonder who love him like you used to love him before life happened. Like you used to love him before you got your heart broken. Like you used to love him before there was death in your family. Like you used to love him before that man left you. Like you used to love him before you got your feelings hurt. I'm talking about since who can say I've been through the storm and the rain, but I still Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. Let me hear you shout, yeah. Oh, yeah. When he asked the question, when he asked the question of them all, Peter spoke up. Chloe has a blessing for speaking up. See, because God now, after 
Peter spoke up. The next words was unto them. The next words was to him, to Peter. Now, he, he, he did go back to them. But when Peter spoke up, I heard Jesus say, Blessed art thou. You spoke up. He did a Chloe. He spoke up. Somebody, you better learn how to speak up. Somebody shout, speak up. Ah, speak up. God is looking for somebody who will speak up when the time is right. Peter spoke up. Uh, one writer said, one writer surmised, I don't know, but it's probably, he's probably right. One writer surmised, uh, Mother Hinton, Mother Christian, that when Jesus asked the question, that they all pause. There was a little pause there. I don't know. And nobody said anything at first. But that Peter got hold to it. I know. Say on, sir. Thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And then I heard Jesus when he said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. To thee, that's single enough. But my Father, which is in heaven, he revealed it. I wonder the next time those uh, uh, black Hebrews, black Muslims, you know, because what they're doing now, black folk are playing the same color game that we condemn white folk for, play, uh, for playing. Black this, black that, black the, black, 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 black. Well, you know what? We just came out of white, 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 white supremacy. White. Well, they had all kinds of ways of saying white. White, white. Oh, oh man, you just got tired of it. Now we're doing the same thing. Now we're doing the same thing. Your complexion has, you, you, your complexion doesn't move you closer to divinity. Just as theirs didn't. It was wrong then and it's wrong now. But the Lord allowed for all of it to be right off of his shoulder. And said, Now, who am I? Who am I? And with everything that's going on, COVID, take the shot, don't take the shot. All this stuff. Who is Jesus to you? All these alternative lifestyles, all this wicked stuff that they're trying to bring in, all these things we're trying to bring into, into the church, the Masons, all these fraternities, sororities. How are you going to be uh, dedicated to the Lord and then pledge it to all this other stuff? All this that we're trying to bring in. All this sowing of your wild oats and all this stuff. The Lord want to know, who am I? Now, I know who I was when you met me, uh, Wooden, in 1977. He said, but I want to know who am I in 2021, July. See, I said to someone today, and I say this with great joy, and my record, is online everywhere. I thank God that over the years, in terms of preaching the gospel and standing for Jesus, we have not allowed daylight to come between us and Jesus Christ. We have not backed off of the gospel. We have not soft peddled the gospel. When you, people talk to me all the time, man, I was watching you, and back then, your hair was black, and it was slick, and you had a mustache, and you were much bigger. Said, but you were preaching holiness then, like you're preaching holiness now. I'm proud of that. That answers the question. Who do you say that I am? I say 
that you are the same God that I said you were back then. Some have quit preaching holiness. Some have gone prosperity, word of faith. They become real nuanced. Uh, they, they've learned that they got the self-censure. Uh, themselves before they get deplatformed, all that stuff and daylight has come between a many of Christians we let the devil fool us we let him fool us and you know what God watch this I'm, I'm going to say it. God has passed judgment See, Christianity is a religion of choices. And choices matter. We thought that we could choose Barabbas over Jesus and then go back to choosing Jesus when it's convenient but we've learned that it don't work that way because we did it we did it during the Obama years we chose as a people to stand by and support a man who endorsed same sex marriage who decked out the church and the, the uh White House and homosexual colors who gave record money to Planned Parenthood where uh, uh, gave over a half a billion dollars a year and what skyrocketed during his reign was the lucrative abortion industry. You know that man wrote in his poem, he says he reached for black folk and all he can feel is the air. Well, you might you, you, that might be true but, but you need to blame the the, the industry that's causing that and that's the abortion industry abortion kills more Americans especially black Americans than the other five leading cause of death combined cancer high blood pressure uh, heart attack homicides uh, accidents we put them all together and they don't kill as many people as abortion does so I'm not saying that he just feels that don't feel anything but the air but that's why and you know what we did whenever he went that way and he endorsed that lifestyle that was our chance to say don't do that I believe had the community spoke up he would have backed down you know why I believe he was back down he's a politician politicians you know enough people say something and uh, they, they got to do what the people say but you know what we said you know what we did? I won't say we did nothing, but we did something. We turned on those who spoke up. Cause y'all sure turned on me. Not you, but oh, they turned on me big time. They tried to, they tried to shut me down. They tried to put me out of business. All I got out of it was elevation. I beat them all. I talk about it from time to time, cause it was a, it was a mighty victory. We did it. Y'all stood by me. Stood by us. I remember. I remember uh, the pressure. And they, 25 preachers uh, threw a press conference against me. And they were too big a coward to invite me to the press conference. They had it at Martin Street Baptist Church. Yes, sir. The preacher got fired for yes, it. Shortly thereafter, they got rid of him. I made bishop. But they had it. Oh, I, I, I know. I know. I'm streaming. I'm telling the truth. Are you Are you concerned for for them if they hear you? I I'd be concerned if they didn't, cause this is what happened. And Mr. Moore, they 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 had a press conference, and they said the problem with Wooden, and called me by name, had it all in the paper, is that he doesn't know that you're supposed to separate your politics from your religion. I called the reporter. I was preaching, uh, where was I? Rocky, where was I when I found out? Uh, we were in Long Island, New York. 
We had to preach in New York that night uh, for Superintendent White, Bishop White. And so I called the uh, I called the reporter long distance, got him on the phone. And uh, I said to the reporter, you should have invited me to the press conference. Because I could have really told y'all something to show you how crazy I am. You, you left out the wrong preacher. Because don't nobody know me like me. I could have given you something. But you wouldn't call me. Then I called the preacher. Who's, who hosted it? Oh, the receptionist was so nice until I told her who I was. I said, I'd like to speak to him. I don't know whether he was in or not, but they wouldn't put him on the phone. And then one day, me and Elder Williams, I had taken my car to get service, and while waiting, we went to get some coffee. While at uh, the coffee shop, I ain't gonna call that name because I don't want to get you give you no business. Because uh, <laughs> I might run the business away. <laughs> uh, we pulled up, and lo and behold, that was the man. Now all of a sudden we're face to face. You know all he had to say? What I knew he would say. Hey Doc. How you doing, Doc? Good to see you, Doc. Now you hosted a press conference against me. You know what? I said, brother, I'm fine. I'm fine. I said to him, I have no complaints. I'm better than ever. Because I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. Now, my flesh said, grab him and pull him out that car. And, and, and do a dusty road. All of us, you know, the flesh speaks to all of us. When you have the Holy Spirit, you don't listen to the flesh. I mean, because who knows? I might have tried to pull him out the car, and he may have done a dusty roads on me. I don't know. You see, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to be funny. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, just, I'm just trying to be fair. Any, anyway, anyway. And God let us survive. A parent told me one time at the school, I'll never forget it. They said, the next time you get ready to say something, we're at, a, we're at a parents' meeting. They didn't like my positions. They said to me, the next time you get ready to speak out, they said, you should meet with us first and tell us what you're going to say. I said, now, nah, she must be a Baptist. <laughs> I mean no harm. I mean no harm. But I'm just being, I'm being direct. I'm being, that's the way it works. Because, see, I'm not going to meet with you before I get ready and tell you what the Lord have told me and see if you will give me permission to say what God said. Mm -hmm. No, sir. And I knew then it's just a matter of time before God's going to get us out of that because they're trying to use that to put pressure on the preacher. So here's what we will do. They make that decision. We'll pull our children out if you don't do what we say. We, we, we end up selling it, selling it at a million dollar profit. Hallelujah. If you trust and never doubt, God will surely bring you out. Somebody said to me, he said, uh, uh, this was years ago, uh, Pastor, I heard your school went out of business. I said, that what you heard? No. I said, you, 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 you still have the academy you operate in? I said, no. But we didn't go out of business. We sold it. See, God will get you out. I told you, Jesus says, if you get the answer right, I'm going to transfigure. See, God will get you right. He'll, 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 he'll get you out. And he, and he got us out. And he got us out big time. Praise the Lord. Guys, out of it and out of all debt. Amen. God did that.